Hello, my name is Eric Stephen, and I am one of the pastors at the Village Church. The following podcast is a ministry of the Village Church. We hope that it inspires you, that it draws you closer to Jesus, and it opens your eyes to the possibilities of living in the kingdom. Enjoy, and God bless. It works. Woohoo! This is going to be a really long message. Let's, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Emmanuel, for God with us, you with us here. Thank you for your spirit in this place. Father, speak to us. Speak to our hearts Speak deep into our lives. Invite us deeper into intimate relationship with you. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word made flesh. Thank you for this beautiful season of the year when we can celebrate what you did, what you're doing, what you yet will do. Father, give us courage to believe truth, silence the voices that would distract us, keep us from hearing you, come close to us, help us to feel your presence. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're wrapping up 1 Timothy, and it's, uh, it's been a fun book to think through, because it's an instruction manual um, from an old man to a young man, and I enjoy that, um, because I like to give young people instructions that they don't follow. So um, so, uh, we get to do some of that again tonight, because we get to hear what Paul says to Timothy. I want to read the passage again. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, To him be honor and eternal domination. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it some have swerved from the faith, Grace be with you. Eric got cute last week and titled his sermon, so I decided to do the same thing. It's flighters, fighters, and hang on tighters, making the good confession. Sensei Sadler, Al Sadler was my um, sensei when I studied Weichiru Karate, and he told us as his students that we would not be able to determine ahead of time what we would do in a dangerous situation. 
Part of karate was to learn to react, but we could never really know because he said, he assured us that adrenaline would kick in and we would simply respond to that. Fight or flight was something we wouldn't be able to determine ahead of time. But I had a pretty good idea of what would happen in a tough encounter like that. When I was in my 20s, I had been playing basketball at the old YMCA building down on Lower Buckeye Road in Phoenix. One night I stayed kind of late and there were a bunch of cars in the parking lot, but it was pretty dark out. They would turned off the lights. And as I was walking to my car, a guy jumped up and with a big, huge knife, like big, big, big knife, and said, give me your money. And I spun around and I ran like a gazelle. Okay, not a gazelle, but charging elephant possibly, right? Like I ran so fast, you would have been amazed. I ran and ran and ran and I was a couple blocks away before I slowed down because I was, couldn't breathe anymore. I was a flighter. When it comes to fighting or flighting, I was a flighter. Paul invites Timothy to be a flighter, to flee from the things that corrupt the church, to turn away from them, to run from them, to run away from the love of money, to run away from endless arguments about meaningless stuff, from the mad pursuit of position and status, from discontentment that Eric talked about a lot last week. You should listen to that sermon again. You've got to remember that Timothy's a young guy, and he's susceptible to the lures of this world. In our youth, that's what we are. We, we're tempted. According to the ways of this world, money is attractive as a source of comfort and contentment. If you have enough of it, you'll be okay. Being right is a comfort, right? I, I always think that's, if, I'll just convince these people that I'm right, right? I, that's why I get in arguments on Facebook. No, oh, I'm right. You're stupid. You know, like we get into these endless arguments, right? Because if I'm right, that's comforting to me. Having st status or position, that's very comforting to me. Paul warns Timothy away from these things. And he invites the church in Ephesus and he invites us to do the same, to be a flighter, to flee from those things, not just kind of turn and walk away or ignore, but to actually flee, like run like a gazelle or rod when he's scared, right? Just run away from it, turn away from it. Be a flighter. Instead, fight the good fight. Paul invites Timothy to fight, to, to fight for the good things, to fight for, what, for what's right, to, to do that instead of flight. Be a fighter. And there's some ways that he invites Timothy to do that, and that's to immerse himself in, in the things that are good and right. Righteousness. He says, he's telling Timothy, pursue, right? Pursue like, you, like you're fleeing one thing, pursue righteousness. Righteousness is doing that which is right, doing that which is God-honoring, doing that, like pursue that, run after that, work hard towards that. 
doing what's right. The practice of godliness. I, um, imagining yourself as the child of God that you are, and as a prince, you are studying the king. Be godly in your actions. Be godly in what you do. He says to pursue and to run after faith. Faith is this abject trust that we're called to, to trust God. It's the, the counterpart, of course, is to trust our wealth or to trust position or status or to trust all those other things. And, and, and Paul says, no, Timothy, uh, no, you folks that are going to read this 2,000 years from now, um, pursue, pursue trust in God and in God alone. Pursue love. And this is the agape love that we've been talking about throughout this book and the book before us that we did before. We, we talk about this love. It's a love that's sacrificial and good and right. Sacrificial love. Pursue sacrificial love. That means not just using the words, right? Like, I love you. We're, we throw that line away around like, like it's something. But, but it's, it's not... It's the action of love. And so fight for love. Pursue loving people. Paul invites Timothy to steadfastness, standing firm, being steadfast in this. And then he invites us and, and Timothy into uh, gentleness, which I always love, right? Like, I, my grand goddaughter, uh, little Jolie, who um, has a lot of physical um, and mental issues, is unable to function in whatever ways we consider normal. So, you know, if you give her a cat to hold, she'll start strangling it, right? Like, it's, she just squeezes because, so we always have to say, Jolie, gentle, <laughs> gentle, right? Do this gently. And that's what we're called to, and that's what Paul is inviting Timothy into, is gentleness. You're not fighting to kill and destroy. You're fighting with gentleness and kindness and love. So he invites Timothy into those things. He invites us into those things. And then to hold fast. To hold Of all the things that I do poorly, and there are many of them, I suspect my, uh, my abilities to persist in any endeavor I take on is pretty high on the list. I start diets, and then I discontinue them when I see tacos, right? I start an exercise program and then discover I have an achy left eyeball and I just won't be able to go to the gym today, right? I decide to clean the office. Matter of fact, that's one of the projects that Kathy would love for me to complete. And I go in and I start opening boxes and start putting stuff away. And then I go, ooh, I didn't know that was there. Oh, that's cool. And then I got to go, oh, I got to get the other. And then, oh, and then pretty soon I walk out and it's worse mess than when I walked in, right? I get distracted by everything. I don't think I'm alone, although I may be your leader in this. I was at Wayne and Barbie's yesterday and Wayne and I, uh, and I were working on my financial stuff, and he was trying to get me to concentrate on those things, and I had my phone, and, and at some point he was talking to me about some Social Security stuff, and so I was going to log in and look at stuff that he was asking me to look at, and he took my hands, and he says, Rod, put your phone down. You can do that later, right now. That's a squirrel, and we're focused on this, this stack here. Yes. And then Barbie came to the door and she says, hey, I just made some beef stroganoff. Would you guys like some for lunch? 
And Wayne goes, no, don't give Rod another squirrel to chase, right? And then I started telling the story about how when Kathy and I were first dating, I discovered that I talked to her mom and I discovered that she loved beef stroganoff. It was her favorite meal. So I um, got all the, the stuff together. I, I didn't know how to cook in those days, but I figured how, how, how oh, right, sorry, back to the sermon. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I can't stay consistent in anything except inconsistency, right? And I don't think I'm alone in that. But Paul tells Timothy, latch on to the faith. Hold on to eternal life. Hang on. Just hold on. And he invites Timothy in a weird way to live with his head in the clouds. When I was a kid, that was an insult. People said to you, you live with your head in the clouds, which meant you were no earthly good, let's face it. And they said, you're high-minded, but you're not much good in the day-to-day, right? It was sort of an insult, but I think Paul's correct. I think he's inviting, he's inviting Timothy to, to live at a different plane, live on a different plane, to live with his head in the clouds, to not get lost in the minutia of the world, but to dwell on what the living, sovereign, immortal, all-powerful, mighty King of kings and Lord of lords is and has done. He tells Timothy to turn his attention upward, to remember that everything in this world is around this relationship. It starts here. It starts up here, not down here. So what are the practical implications of doing that, of living heavenly-minded? Well, we've been talking about being neighbors, and, well, you'd become a good neighbor, right? Like, you become a nice neighbor, one of those kind, generous neighbors. We talk about laying down our lives for our spouses a lot. Do we actually do that? Sacrifice what we want for what he or she wants? Laying down my life for my spouse is giving up what I desire for the sake of the other. Do you do that? The practical implications of living heavenly minded would mean that you do. It would mean that you treat your boss just like that your boss was Jesus. Like, we're always thinking about our, well, that, my boss is a jerk, or I have the greatest boss in the world, or I have this wonderful boss, or I have this horrible boss, or I don't like my boss, or my boss is annoying, my boss has these bad habits. What happens if you thought about your boss as though your boss was Jesus? If you were heavenly minded and you could see upward, what kind of employee would you be then? Being scrupulously honest. I went off on a little squirrel thing this morning about trying to be honest, right? And I took a bunch of, uh, I got a bunch of groceries and they forgot to charge me for all the little water thing that I had on the bottom of the cart. And so then I felt bad. So I went back to try to be scrupulously honest because that's what you're supposed to be if you're heavenly minded. And then you go back and I, and I brought that in to the store and I found the person who had checked checked with me, uh, the, uh, my groceries out and I explained to her what had happened and she said, oh, thank you. And she started to rectify the situation to charge me more money. The boss came over and asked what had happened and so she explained and he fired her on the spot. And I said, no, don't do that. And he said, nope, this is her last straw. She's done this way too many times. I'm done. She's gone. And I said, I, I don't, I don't, ah, no. And then, and then he said, um, and by the way, the water's on us. Just keep it. Well, that even makes me feel worse, right? And, and so 
So it's not easy to be heavenly minded and it doesn't make all your problems go away. But what is it like to be scrupulously honest? What's it like to care for those who cannot care for themselves? I, I watched my son Justin with um, his little goddaughter Jolie and I see the love and compassion that he has for someone who's not his daughter and the careful care that he takes of her. Mm. How about being patient with those who are on the journey? We, we like to rush people along. We like to get them to the place where they're mature or where they're doing the smart, wise thing. No, no when we live heavenly minded, we don't do that. <clears throat> I have discovered in my old age that one of the things that is helpful to me, and maybe it'll be helpful to you, is to literally ask Jesus to show you what to do in any situation. I I think when we talk about praying uh, continually, I think that's what we're talking about. That in every situation, when I I want to be heavenly minded, I I simply say, Jesus, what what do you want me to do now? What, What should I do here in this situation? I love that that's part of the Trinitarian prayer is that we're treating Jesus like he's our big brother and our big brother knows what to do. He always knows what to do. And so so when we do that, just simply as part of of your lifestyle, a way of being, um, say, Jesus, just whisper it to yourself. Just think it to yourself. What do you want me to do? And then do confidently what comes to mind. Doesn't mean it's going to be wrong, right because you may get it wrong, you may hear wrong. Doesn't matter. Jesus cleans up messes. He's really good at cleaning up messes. Matter of fact, the Holy Spirit always walks behind us cleaning up our messes. That's, I think, his primary task, particularly in my case. But I think he goes, he surrounds us, he's over us, he's under us, he's all around us. But for sure, he's behind us cleaning up the messes. If Jesus is who he says he is, King of kings, Lord of lords, then doing this is a no-brainer. Paul tells Timothy to make the good confession. And he does that and he he shows the perfect model of a good confession, right? He shows that Jesus makes the good confession. That Jesus stands before Pilate as the son of the living God and that Pilate accuses him of being the king of the Jews and king over all, a wannabe. And Jesus understands the reality of what that means. Because Jesus is the king of the Jews, and he is the king of us, and he is king over all. And that's not a philosophical assertion. It's not open to argument, to discussion. If it's not true, then you're wasting your time in endless arguments. but it is true, and it's true because it's factual, not theoretical. I I can't impress on you enough that Jesus is king over all, and that's a reality. That's not, well, Rod thinks God is king over all. Jesus is king over all. No, it doesn't matter what Rod thinks. It's a fact. It's an absolute fact. It's not something you have to mess around with. I, I love, when I was preparing the sermon, I, I was reading um, John Calvin's commentaries on, on this book, and, and somewhere in there, when he's talking about these particular verses, he, he says about Christ um, these things. I'll, I'll read it. What he now adds about Christ contains a remarkable confirmation. For we are taught that we are not in the school of Plato to learn philosophy from him and to hear him discoursing in the shade about idle disputes, 
but that the doctrine which Timothy professes was ratified by the death of the Son of God. Christ made his confession before Pilate not in a multitude of words, but in reality, that is, by undergoing a voluntary death. For although Christ chose to be silent before Pilate rather than speak in his own defense, because he had come thither, devoted already to a certain condemnation, yet in his silence there was a defense of his doctrine, not less magnificent than if he had defended himself with a loud voice. He ratified it by his blood and by the sacrifice of his death, better than he could have ratified it by his voice. This confession the apostle calls good, for Socrates also died, and yet his death was not a satisfactory proof of his doctrines, the doctrines he held. But when we hear that the blood of the Son of God was shed, that is an authentic seal which removes all our doubt. Accordingly, Whenever our hearts waver, let us remember that we should always go to the death of Christ for confirmation. What cowardice would there be in deserting such a leader going before us to show us the way? Isn't that amazing? That's good stuff that that good old John Calvin wrote, right? It, th- this isn't just some theoretical thing. This isn't some s- theoretical discourse. This is reality. You can't confess Jesus as king if you don't recognize what he's done, the sacrifice he's made. And you also can't confess without understanding and confessing your own sin, your inability to live life perfectly. Confession is two things. One of the parts of confession is is what we did earlier, right? I confess that I fall short. I confess it. I acknowledge it. I state the truth about my condition before God. I say what's true. Paul tells Timothy to make the good confession. The good confession that Jesus offers his life for Timothy and reigns over his life. Any argument that takes Timothy away from that reality is a foolish one. And it's detrimental. Paul invites Timothy and us to make the good confession, to hold on to the truth that Jesus died for us. All other pursuits are meaningless. Stating the truth about who Jesus is, King of Kings and Lord of King of Kings and Lord of Lords, is also confession. Two kinds of confession. Confessing that I don't measure up and confessing that Jesus does. And when we confess, we need forgiveness right we're we're looking for forgiveness <clears throat> what what do you need forgiveness for <laughs> student loans probably quite a few of us would benefit from that primarily what we need forgiveness from is that we put our trust elsewhere Timothy, Paul says, Timothy, don't put your trust in anything other than God. Don't put your trust anywhere other than in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a waste of time. It distracts from the realities of what God is. And and I can like if you're if you're like me, you you sit in that moment and you go, I do put my trust elsewhere. I'm getting ready to retire next year from the village. And so I'm thinking through things of what that looks like. And I'm thinking through things like, wow, what are we going to live on? And how's that going to work? And... And it's hard to think about because I, I wonder and I worry and I, and I have to go back to the reality that I, 
my faith isn't in my social security or retirement plans or any of those things. That's not where my hope is. It's, it's scary, kind of, but it's not really because, you know, some of you have a spare room if all else fails, right? So it's, it's okay to not be concerned. It's okay because my trust isn't in the things of this world. This is, I really enjoyed this. Probably can't read it. It says, so leaving it with a broker didn't do any good at all. So he buried the treasure with the broker and he's got nothing. Paul closes this letter to Timothy with the reminder that it's hard on rich people. It's hard to be rich. It's hard for rich people to live in a world of faith. Why don't you go ahead and raise your hand if you're wealthy? For those of you who didn't raise your hands, you're all liars. You are incredibly wealthy. Your needs are being met. I suspect that your bellies are full. If not, they soon will be. You all are going place with a roof over your head tonight. You're going to sleep, likely, in a comfortable space. You have each other. You have this community. We don't think of ourselves as wealthy, but we are. We are rich. Rich beyond anything that we can imagine. Because wealth, richness, money isn't the thing. It's not the thing. Paul closes with this reminder that it's really hard for rich people to live in this world, this world of faith, right? If I put my confidence in God, then, yeah, my retirement, whatever that looks like, Kathy retiring next year as well, whatever that's going to look like, Um, If my confidence is in my wealth and my bank accounts and all that kind of stuff, wow, kind of nerve-wracking. But that's not where my confidence is. There's, if we're wealthy, and I think we all are, (laughs) whether we cared to admit it or not, um, if we're wealthy, there's two things that Paul sort of invites Timothy and us into. Two things to do with your wealth. Like, I love that that Paul is going back to this theme sort of at the end because money is the big temptation. I'll be okay if. The two things that you can do with your wealth, number one is don't put any confidence in it. Don't put any confidence in it. You will have it. You'll not have it. You'll have lots of it. You'll have some of it. You'll be dead cold broke. I always loved when I was a kid, we were really, really broke. <laughs> and so we were eating tomatoes on bread because my mom had canned a whole bunch of tomatoes. We had that like five nights a week, and that was dinner. But we had bread and tomatoes, right? And we sat down at every meal and We thanked God for bread and tomatoes. I don't like stewed tomatoes on bread, but we survived. You might not have, sorry, um, with your allergy to tomatoes. Um, But there was something I learned in that, and that the promises of this world are meaningless. When it comes to wealth, Bitcoin is not your safety net. For those of you who think, oh, I'm going to get, I'm going to make my fortune in Bitcoin or I'm going to make my fortune in whatever, pick it, pick it, just whatever you think. Don't put your confidence there. Nice thing about being an old man is I've seen all these things before. 
buy silver, it's the next thing. Buy gold, it's the next thing. Buy this, it's the next thing. Invest in the euro, invest in this. And my mother has, mother-in-law has some gold Krugerrands in her safe deposit box and someday they'll all be ours and then we'll be okay, right? Mm, maybe. Don't put your confidence there. Your safety net is that you are bought by the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ whose blood will sacrifice for you. That's where your confidence is. The second thing that you can do with money, and this is a really cool thing to do, is you can give it away. You can use it to do good works. You can offer it to others. And in doing that, you build up treasure in the heavenly realm, remember, in the look up realm, where Timothy's invited to look. When you do that, that's where you will find joy and pleasure and delight. I got such a kick out of this little scheme that people thought up to uh, get Eric and Sue a new oven for their house. I thought that was so fun. And it was fun to participate, as many villagers were able to do, and to have them not see it coming, and to have the joy of now being able to put nine pies in the oven instead of three or whatever it was, and being able to... Uh, be burdened by having more and more of you over for dinner. No, it's just, it's, it's this beautiful gift, right? It's, it's something you can do with your money. It's something you can do with your money that won't help you in this world. I mean, Eric's still going to tell you you're a sinner and he, you, you didn't buy his glove. You, some of you thought you might. You didn't. Trust me, I worked with him for 20 years. He's going to go after your sin patterns just as hard as he ever did. Um, it, and, of course, he doesn't know who gave what anyway. But, but it's, that's, that's not the deal. You're, it's not a bargaining thing. You, 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 get tre- you built up treasure for yourself. Giving it away. And you say, well, Rod, if I give it all away, then I won't have anything. I gotta, you know, you gotta take care of number one. And that's the lie that we believe. It's the satanic lie that we believe. Now, I'm not telling you that you have to give away everything. I'm not one of those guys who says, you know, because wealth isn't the problem. The money isn't the problem. It's the attitude towards it that is the problem. It's where you put your trust that's the problem. Having money is a beautiful thing. You should use it. You should live well. You should be comfortable. And use it to help others. Use it to do good works. Use it. Just don't put your confidence in it. It's interesting that Paul concludes this letter with grace be with you. I really love that. Early on in my life, I would kind of skim over the openings of books and skim over the endings of books. Okay, he's just saying goodbye to people or saying hello to people. It's kind of like, you know, the letters we write to whom it may concern, and then at the end, you know, best regards and our signature, and it's just meaningless stuff. It's not. Some of the richest things that are written in Scripture are those openings and those endings, and this is a particularly important one. Grace be with you. Paul knows who he's talking to. He's talking to a young man who's threatened by this world, who who has to try to navigate a world that's calling him to put his trust in places other than in Jesus. He knows what what Timothy faces because Paul's faced the same things. And Paul's been a failure in it. He says elsewhere, the the good things that I would do, I don't do, and the things I would not do, that I do. And he gets mad at himself. He's just like us. By the way, You should know that as we wrap up this book. 
Timothy and Paul aren't special. They're not endowed with a particular kind of spirit that goes beyond the spirit that we have, right? They're just regular folks. They're tempted just like I'm tempted. They're tempted just like you're tempted. They're not special other than that the Spirit of God comes on them to to write the words that they write, and that makes what they say special, but they're as messed up as you are. And Paul knows this in the deepest places, and he says, grace be with you, Timothy, grace be with you. And I say that to you, grace be with you. You're not going to get this right. You're going to put your confidence in things you shouldn't put your confidence in. (laughs) I guarantee it. I've done it. We've all done it, if we're honest. We all have fears. When Eric talked last week about this whole idea that we're we're not um, uh, content, right? Our lack of contentment. That's because there's a fear factor. What happens if God's not good? What happens if I give away my money and then, oh, I need it? Paul says to Timothy, grace be with you. That's an offering of God's grace, God's mercy, God's kindness, God's love. Do you think God will abandon you? One of the richest joys that I have experienced in my relationship with my mother over the years was when we put her in this care facility and she did not want to be there. She begged to go back home. She said, I just want to live in my house and die there. And we said, yeah, mom, that ship sailed. You can't do that. Sorry. And she wept for a little bit and we were sad and she was sad. And then she said, well, God's taken care of me all these years. I don't suspect he'll drop me now. Know that. God's taken care of me all these years. I don't imagine he's going to drop me now. Grace be with you. Any responses? Anything that the Spirit's telling you? Anything that you'd like to comment on